I feel like I speak for my fellow millennials when I say that I am both fascinated and bewildered by TikTok as a platform. But as an avid reader, the viral power of book talk intrigues me. I set out on a journey to discover if the most popular book talk recommendations are actually worth the hype or not so much. I guess what I really want to know is can book talk be trusted? I decided to pick five books that I am constantly seeing on my For You page, read them, and see if they're really all that. So let me introduce you to the five books that will be featured in today's video. Our first book is The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood, a grumpy sunshine, fake dating, rom-com between scientists. And as a self-described, very picky and hesitant romance reader, this book has its work cut out for it. Next up, we have We Were Liars by E. Lockhart. This is a YA suspense novel about a group of friends that are, you guessed it, liars. I have no idea what to expect from this, but I've heard multiple times that it's better if you go into it without any expectations, without knowing anything about the plot. So I'm not going to spoil myself. I'm just going to dive in and see what happens. And now for something completely different. We have The Body Keeps the Score. And this is a nonfiction book about what happens in the mind, the body, and the brain when someone is healing from trauma. This is something that's been on my TBR for a while since it started popping up all over the internet. I have high expectations. I basically expect this to heal my trauma, do my dishes, and help me evolve into my best self. So we'll see if it can do that. Next, we have The Atlas Six by Olive e. Blake. This is, I feel like, the iconic book talk recommendation. It was a self-published fantasy novel that gained so much traction, went so viral on book talk that the author got a traditional publishing deal. I have the self-published version because the cover is just far superior in my personal opinion. And this book has secret societies, magic, lost ancient knowledge, and a mysterious initiation. So sounds pretty good. Last but not least, Cloud Cuckoo Land by Anthony Doerr. This is a speculative fiction novel that I've heard takes place over 600 years. It also apparently jumps around between timelines and points of view and is kind of confusing and hard to follow, which if you know anything about my preference in books, you'll know that is a selling point for me. The weirder, the more confusing, the better. I'm a little intimidated but I'm excited. So here are the five books I'm reading for this video. I am super excited to dive in and I hope you're excited to come along with me on this literary journey through book talk recommendations. I'm gonna start with The Body Keeps the Score because I typically prefer to read nonfiction in slower chunks, a little bit at a time over a longer period of time. I feel like that really helps with the absorption for me of the material and gives me time to reflect between sections. I just feel like I get so much more out of nonfiction when I read it slowly. So let's get started. I love tabbing books as I read just to mark anything that catches my attention, especially when it comes to nonfiction so I can go back and reference different things. But in the past, I've been a little lazy about having any particular system. So I decided to make a really simple annotation plan for this read. So I just popped a post-it on the inner cover and I put one of each color of tab that I'm using for this read and then just wrote what they represent. So this resonates with me deeply, do more research, quotes, do the work, so actionable things and stats or facts. For nonfiction specifically, I also like to highlight, and I personally love to use this Tombow dual tip brush pen in 990. So it's sort of a light beige color when I'm highlighting because it's a really subtle color on the page. It's just a little bit darker than the page itself. So it's not really jarring like using a neon or something. And I like that because it's dual tipped, I can use either the thicker felt tip to highlight sort of like a traditional highlighter, or I can use the finer tip on the other side to underline certain sections. Okay, so I just finished reading the introduction and the first chapter of The Body Keeps the Score, and I'm not gonna give any thoughts yet because it's too early, but as you can see, I've tabbed quite a bit. So it's definitely making an impression so far. I'll link these specific tabs in the description box down below. So I think my plan now is to take a little bit of a break from The Body Keeps the Score and let the introduction and the first chapter sort of percolate overnight. And I think in the meantime, I'm going to get started on the love hypothesis just for something completely different. But before I leave you to start reading this, I want to talk to you quickly about today's video's sponsor, 
Audible. So Audible was kind enough to sponsor this video and I'm so glad they did because I love using Audible to listen to audiobooks. As you will have seen in the footage of me starting to read The Body Keeps the Score, I was both reading the physical book and listening to the audiobook simultaneously. And that's a technique that I love to use, especially when I'm reading nonfiction, because it really helps me to hyper focus in on what I'm reading and absorb so much more of the meaning of the nuance of the text. I feel like there are certain things things that I tend to pick up on easier when I'm reading with my eyeballs and other things that slide in easier through my ear holes. So I just really appreciate the combination. Listening to audiobooks to me is just like having someone tell you a story because that's literally what it is. And who doesn't love being told a good story? <laughs> Especially if you can be told a story while you do your daily commute or do chores or do some really boring repetitive task at work. It's fantastic. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. Members also get full access to a growing selection of included audiobooks, Audible originals, guided fitness and meditation programs, sleep tracks, and podcasts through their Plus catalog. You can download or stream all the titles you want. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Go to audible.com slash plant-based or text plant-based to 500-500 to try Audible today. Thank you so much to Audible for sponsoring this video. So I'm going to scuttle off and start the love hypothesis and I'm going to use the same tabs but in a different color scheme. Lighter, happier pastels which seems appropriate. So that's the plan and I'll be back in probably a couple days to check in with you and let you know how everything's going. So it's two days later and I finished the love hypothesis and I have some thoughts. <laughs> so when I first started reading this book, I didn't have any particular system for tabbing. I was just marking things that stood out to me, whether they were positive or negative with whatever color I felt like. But after a couple chapters, I realized that one very specific pet peeve of mine was gonna be popping up a lot. <laughs> and I thought it might be interesting to use a specific color to mark those instances just for science purposes, which seems appropriate for this book. So I started tabbing that specific pet peeve with the blue that matches the cover and I ended up actually running out of those blue tabs about halfway through. <laughs> Let me start with the positive things. I will say that this book was sweet. I found parts of it funny. I think that my sense of humor gels well with the humor of this book. There are references to Star Trek, mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell. It worked for me. I found myself chuckling pretty often while I was reading. It was easy to get through, lighthearted. I liked Olive well enough, our protagonist. She was a little bit of a blank slate, which I think is pretty common from my experience with reading contemporary romance. And then Adam, the love interest, was even more of a blank slate than Olive, unfortunately. His personality was basically just being grumpy. But despite that, I did like Adam for the most part. Again, he wasn't the most complex character. He wasn't the most well-developed, but I didn't mind him and I wanted them to get together. I was rooting for them. I also enjoyed the setting. This takes place at Stanford biology department. Olive, the protagonist, is doing her PhD and Adam is a tenured professor in the department, though not her professor. So that's something to keep in mind if you don't like power imbalances in relationships. They're also eight years apart, so an age gap there. But I did enjoy the setting. I thought it was really interesting. I enjoyed the backdrop of academia. That's kind of it for the positives. On to the negatives. So the first thing that I will mention for negatives is that the villain is a cartoon, like the most cartoony villain to have ever been cartoonishly villainous. And it's kind of silly because yes, the book is kind of quirky and silly and fun, but it is supposed to be set in real life. And this character is so over the top evil that I feel like it kind of took away from the message that I think Ali Hazelwood was trying to get across. So I do wish the villain had been a little bit more subtle in their villainy. Another thing that I was kind of iffy on was the demisexual representation. The protagonist is demisexual as far as how she defines herself on the page, but the word itself is not in the book. It's not up to me to say if it's good representation or not, but I did feel kind of weird about it. So I spent some time reading Own Voices reviews and it was a really mixed bag as far as if people felt it was good representation or not. So I'm not going to draw any kind of conclusion on the rep, but I just wanted to tab that, highlight that. Another drawback for me here is that this book started as a fanfic about 
Kylo Ren and the love interest Adam is based on the actor Adam Driver. And I talked about this a little bit back when I reviewed Spoiler Alert, which started as a fan fiction of Game of Thrones and focused on the actor who plays Jamie. that I found it in poor taste to create a character that is so clearly a very specific person who is still alive and then to write graphic sex scenes about them. It just feels like a violation. Like it's just really uncomfortable to me. And it's fine if characters are inspired by real people, but I just wish that authors would put a little bit more effort into distinguishing their characters, not only for the privacy aspect and just respect for the person it's based on, but also for just the creativity aspect. Like it just feels a little lazy to create a character that is just a person who exists or a character that already exists and then to leave it at that and not do anything to distinguish them. So I just wish that books would stop doing that because it's just, it's weird. So on to my biggest pet peeve about this book and that is this focus on hyper gender specific stereotypes when it comes to the bodies of the love interests in heterosexual romances. So the way that that translates in my experience is that the male love interests are often super tall, super broad and muscular and large. They are described in that way excessively. They have very big hands. They're five feet taller than every other human. Like just to the extreme of what we expect men to be if they are hyper masculine. And then the female love interests are the opposite. So the female love interests are meant to be very small, both short and tiny around. They're supposed to be more frail. They can be picked up really easily. And this physical dynamic of huge giant man and tiny frail woman being repeated constantly in romance is unsettling to me for a couple reasons. Growing up with constant messaging that women are supposed to be tiny to be feminine and to be attractive was really, really hard on my self-esteem, on my body image. I just think that messaging in general is really harmful. And I think the opposite is true too. I think it's really damaging to men, this expectation that they should all be like six foot five because that's so out of the norm when it comes to men. I think the average man is five eight. I'll put the right height on the screen if I'm wrong, but the average man is not over six feet and certainly not well over six feet. And the average man is also not built like a superhero. <laughs> and it's just as harmful for men to get this constant messaging that if they're not over six feet, they're not worth love. So I just find that dynamic in general off-putting and I hate how prevalent it is in romance. And it was excessive in this book, the number of times that Adam was referenced as being a giant, huge, massive, he literally pushed a truck across a parking lot in one scene. I wish I was kidding. Oh, and one more thing, the sex scene. I had heard it was really hot. For me personally, it was not. There were some really weird choices in the sex scene that literally had me probably making the face I am right now and my brain kind of freezing for a couple minutes while I tried to process how what they were talking about was even possible by the laws of physics. So with all that being said, I give the love hypothesis to gigantic, super tall, truck pushing men out of five. The next one I wanna start is The Atlas Six by Olive Blake. I'm excited for this one. I have another set of tabs and a nice dark color scheme to go along with this cover. And hopefully this will be more than a two star read. <laughs> Okay, it's been a couple more days and I finished two more books, The Atlas Six and We Were Liars. So I'm gonna start with The Atlas Six. There's sex, there's secrets, there's magic and intrigue. And honestly, I hoped I would like this book. That's why I bought it months ago. I'd heard so much hype and I wanted to like it. And it's certainly not a perfect book, but I have to say I was very pleasantly surprised by this book and I really enjoyed it. The concept itself is super intriguing. I really enjoyed learning about the society itself and collecting all of the world building about this version of the world that is very similar to our own, but affected of course by there being magic. I also really liked the characters. I feel like all of the characters were really well crafted. They felt complex. They were interesting each in their own way. They each had their own flesh out 
background that really informed who they were as people. They all had their own little quirks and habits and vibe going on. And I also really enjoyed how each of their magical specialties tied into who they were as people and how they viewed the world. I thought that was really well done. They were also incredibly diverse when it comes to background, class, race, lived experiences. I really enjoyed the dark academia atmosphere in this book. That very particular vibe of being cozy by the fire while also knowing you could be murdered at any moment. <laughs> I loved the magic system in this book. I loved the way that it was combined with science and the way that they approached learning about different types of magic through a scientific lens. That was really satisfying to me. And I felt like the book was really well paced. It's not a short book. It's coming in at just under 400 pages and it has a lot of different point of view characters. It has a kind of a lot of ground to cover. And I really enjoy the artwork in the book as well. It's really beautiful. Here's one, for example. Here's another one here. This one here. I liked that this book was exploring a lot of different things when it comes to family and belonging and coming to terms with who you are, coming of age, but in a more literal way in that they are discovering what they're truly capable of, learning the boundaries of their magic, of their power, a lot of discussion of power in general, how much power is too much power, what will people do for power, morality and mortality and exclusivity and the risk inherent in realizing our full potential while acknowledging that there's also a risk in staying in the dark. Lots of really interesting concepts to sink your teeth into. If you're a fantasy reader who enjoys fantasy through a more scientific lens, I think you'll really enjoy this. And honestly, really the only drawback for me when it comes to this book is the ending. I know it's the first in the series and it was certainly setting itself up for the next book. It wanted to leave questions unanswered so that people would be encouraged to continue reading and I understand that but I do wish there had been a little bit more of a conclusion. So with all that being said, I was really impressed by this and I give it four incredibly powerful magical initiates out of five. I also finished We Were Liars today. I actually started and finished this today. So this is the story of the youngest generation of a very wealthy white family who go to their grandfather and grandmother's private island every year to spend the summer together. And one particular summer, something happens. And this book is the process of remembering what happened to her, essentially. And I gotta say, this book didn't really work for me. It's interesting to look at the reviews online. I looked out of curiosity because I finished it and just felt so at a loss about how to describe what I was feeling. And it seems like people either love this book or hate it. It just didn't feel like this book had much of a purpose. It was a super quick read. It's poetic, there's purple prose, there's incorporation of fairy tales. And at first I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm into that, sure. But as the book continued, it started to get more and more irritating and started to feel really pretentious, especially with the constant, very overdramatic metaphors, especially for how our protagonist is feeling. The main character was insufferable. She's constantly whining about everything and she doesn't really have much of a personality, which makes it hard to root for her. I don't mind not loving everything about about a character, I think it makes them more interesting, but there just wasn't anything there to grab onto. She was very loosely drawn, just like all of the other characters. The issues explored in this book, including elitism, classism, privilege, racism, nepotism, were all talked about in a really bland black and white way. There wasn't a lot of nuance was very straightforward, not particularly thoughtful or insightful. I will say I was surprised by the twist. And if you do plan on reading this, I encourage you to go into it without knowing what the twist is because that's really all this book has to offer, sadly. But while the twist surprised me, it didn't make me feel anything. And I've seen in a lot of the positive reviews that people were saying they sobbed their eyes out, they cried so much, this book destroyed them. And I can see why on the surface, but I just, didn't feel anything. And I am very easy to make cry, okay? I am a very emotional human being. I will cry because one of my cats looks at me and I just think their face is so adorable and I start to cry, okay? <laughs> like literally anything will make me cry. And I didn't. I totally dry eyes in the house reading this book. I just didn't care. And part of that is that the thing that happens happens because characters who are old enough to know better do really dumb sh and it makes it hard to feel this sense of a tragedy because it just feels like who in the world would do this? Like it doesn't make any sense at all. I am going to stop talking about this book and I give it one insufferable privileged liar out of five. 
Moving on to the final book of this challenge, Cloud Cuckoo Land. I started this over my morning coffee and read about 50 pages, so just getting started, and hopefully I can finish reading this today. We'll see. It is quite a long book, so we'll see how I do. Okay, so I have finally finished Cloud Cuckoo Land and I'm gonna talk to you about it. But first I do wanna briefly touch on The Body Keeps the Score, which as you'll recall, I've been reading throughout this whole challenge. And you might notice that I haven't finished it. I'm approaching halfway through if we don't include the huge amount of resources and appendices at the back. At first I was trying to push myself through to finish this for this video, but as I continued, and as you can see, I have used a ridiculous number of tabs already. It was really resonating with me. I was constantly finding things to highlight and to flag, and I constantly found myself having to pause to really think through what I was reading and process it. And it just wasn't a quick reading process by any means. I was trying to increase the speed on Audible so I could listen a lot faster and hopefully also read faster, but I just found that I was getting stressed because it's a pretty dense book. There's a lot of scientific information and there's a lot of emotion. It's it's recounting in pretty grueling detail, really intense traumas of individual people. And I just found myself needing to stop and take a breath. I finally realized that if literally anyone in the world was reading this book on my recommendation and was doing the same thing that I was trying to do, which is rush through it, I would tell them to slow down and to be kind to themselves and to take the time to recover and process what they were reading. So I decided to take my own advice and that's what I'm doing. I fully intend to finish this book. I will continue working through it, but I need to take more time to do justice to the book itself and also for my own mental health. So that is what I'm doing. I will say, even though I haven't finished it, of course, so far this book is really amazing and I am pretty certain, unless the second half really goes off the rails, that I'll be giving it five stars. So if you have been curious about it, I think book talk is right about The Body Keeps the Score. Very much worthwhile, but I won't be finishing it for this video. Moving on to the final book I'm going to talk about in this video, which is Cloud Cuckoo Land. I finished this book today and did pretty color coordinated tabs. And um, I cried a lot reading this book. Many tears were shed. This book is expansive. It travels across time and space and connects all of these seemingly separate characters and moments in history together in a really beautiful way. I loved the writing. I loved the way that the multiple POVs were woven together like a tapestry. I loved the sincerity and the humor and the characters were so special. They jumped off the page. They felt real. I really cared about them. I really grew to feel attached to them and each world, each place and time felt well-established, felt three-dimensional and rich. This book explores love and loss, destruction and creation, longing and complacency, sacrifice and hope, and I think above all, relationships and what it means to be human and to be alive and what really matters. Just, you know, small, insignificant themes. <laughs> I loved the intertwining narratives. This book was beautiful. It really blew me away. If you don't like books that are very long, complicated, possibly a little bit convoluted at times, a little heavy on purple prose, you probably won't like this. But I wouldn't take anything out of it at the same time. I wouldn't make anything simpler. I wouldn't remove any storyline. Just perfect as it is. <laughs> I love this book and I give it five children putting on a play in a small local library out of five. So these are the five books that I read based on book talk recommendations on my For You page, and I had mixed results, but I have found a few new favorites, books that are gonna stick with me for a really long time, and I had a whale of a time tabbing all these books. It's glorious. <laughs> So to bring this video to a close, can TikTok be trusted when it comes to book recommendations? Yes and no. Just like any social media platform, you have to find the creators who align with you, people who love the books you love, and don't connect with the books that you don't connect with so that you can get to know their taste and get to trust their recommendations. I don't think any algorithm will ever do as good of a job recommending books as a fellow human being. So go forth, 
and be recommended. <laughs> Whether you choose to get your recommendations from TikTok or YouTube or Instagram or anywhere else on the internet or in real life from your local librarian or friends and family. And if you've been encouraged to pick up any of these five books based on this video, please let me know in a comment. I would love to know which book or books you're interested in checking out. And of course, if you've already read any or all of the books discussed in this video, please leave your thoughts down below. I would love to know if we agreed, if we disagreed. And I'm glad to have discovered that my For You page on TikTok is not bad at recommending books. I may have to pick up a few more. Thank you again to Audible for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to go to audible.com slash plant-based or to text plant-based to 500-500 to try Audible for free for 30 days. Leave some sort of book emoji in the comments if you made it all the way to the end so I know you're a real one. Thank you so, so much to my patrons for your support. If you at home wanna join the squad, feel free. There's a link in the card and in the description box down below. And with that, I'm gonna get going. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you really soon in my next one. Bye friends.